Thank you so much for being here. This is the 2009 Montana Festival of the Book. And in fact, it's the 10th annual Montana Festival of the Book, which I think is reason for celebration. Um, before, yes, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I'm Ken Egan. I'm the Executive Director of Humanities Montana. I feel very lucky to be in that role. And as one of my first official acts, I get to introduce this panel. So the session you have attended is called New Directions in the Study of Montana Writing. And our assembled luminaries have all published in this book, which is, I must say, part of my task is to stress, this book is for sale out there. And at the end of the session, these authors have agreed to appear out there to sign books. So if you want to, if you already have one in hand, they will sign it. Or if you'd like to purchase one, that would be wonderful. So, so let me introduce them and then Brady Harrison is going to take over. Brady's going to serve as moderator. Brady Harrison is an associate professor of English at the University of Montana, Missoula. He is the author of Agent of Empire, William Walker and the Imperial Self in American Literature. Good read, by the way, like it. And was the editor and contributor to the collection of essays all our stories are here. So, uh, he's also the editor of a scholarly edition of Richard Harding Davis's Soldiers of Fortune. And then next to Brady is Jim Raines. Jim Raines teaches Native American Studies and Cultural Anthropology at Montana State University Billings. Jim uh, earned a BA from Rocky Mountain College, an MA from the University of Montana, and a PhD from the University of Michigan. Jim is also an enrolled member of the Creek Nation of Oklahoma. Jim has taught at the college level and written about 20th century American literature since 1990. Uh, specifically in this collection, Jim has written what I think is a definitive essay on Darcy McNichol, appropriate since we're actually celebrating the surrounded as one book Montana. And then next to Jim is Nancy Cook. Nancy teaches English here at the University of Montana, Missoula. Her publications include work on the language of US water policy, on ranching, on Montana writers, and on authenticity in Western American writing. I should add, she's one witty writer. Her essays are incredibly funny, I like them. Currently, she is at work on a book-length study of women who lived and worked in Western national parks. So her essay in All Our Stories Are Here is titled Home on the Range, Montana Romance, and Geographies of Hope. Next to Nancy, then, is Carl Olson. He lives here in Missoula and works for the Missoula Public Library. In 2008, he was co-curator of Montana's first out at the library exhibit and series devoted to lesbian and gay literature and history. And his essay in All Our Stories Are Here is titled West of Desire, Queer Ambivalence in Montana Literature. And then finally, O. Allen Weltzine is professor of English at the University of Montana Western. He has edited, co-edited, and authored four books, most recently a memoir, A Father in an Island, Reflections on Loss, which is available for sale here, I might add. And the Norman McLean Reader, which is fantastic. Uh, just a brief comment about that. Many people have asked me if the Norman McLean Leader, Reader basically duplicates other editions of McLean's. No, this is new, fresh material. So if you haven't seen it, it's terrific stuff. And so uh, Alan's essay in All Our Stories Are Here is called Just Regular Guys, Homophobia and the Code of the West, The Construction of Male Identity in Savage and Prue. Without further ado, I give you the panel and Brady Harrison. Thanks, um, Technically, shall I bring this over or can you all hear me? No. No. Great over. Yeah. How's that? Okay. Well, thank you, Ken, for those kind introductions. And uh, I'd like to thank my uh, fellow panelists uh, and contributors 
to this book, which is available for a very reasonable price uh, over there uh, outside. Uh, and I'd like to thank you uh, for uh, being here this morning. Uh, how we envision our time uh, going is um, each one of us, in turn, will just take a very uh, few brief moments to describe our contribution to the book and say a little bit about our research interests and ongoing uh, Montana interest. And then we hope to open things uh, for discussion and so that we hope that uh, after we rattle on for just a wee bit that you will have questions and comments and um, we'll, we will do our best uh, thereafter. Uh, so uh, my, my part of this book actually is very, uh, very minimal. Uh, I edited the book, uh, which meant I just kept asking these folks to write and rewrite uh, for days and days and days and, and Carl will tell you for years. Uh, and uh, it, it, um, the book came about uh, because, uh, as you uh, no doubt know, there's so much great Montana writing. There's just this super abundance of wonderful poetry, uh, short fiction, novels, uh, mysteries, uh, histories. There's so much great Montana writing, but it never really gets enough critical attention. And so that was the occasion uh, for the book. And so for my part, just to sort of set the terrain uh, for uh, the conversation to follow, I'll just read the first paragraph uh, from the introduction. Uh, the introduction is called Toward a Post-Populist Criticism, and uh, this is just to, to uh, suggest uh, why uh, this book came about and the kinds of things that we're interested in collectively. And there, there are more uh, contributors than are here. Uh, we're enough to fill a room. Uh, so there's lots of great stuff in here uh, beyond what you'll hear about today. So from the introduction. As even a casual scholar of Montana writing will note, the production of fine writing far outstrips the critical inquiry into the state's extraordinary literary corpus. If a handful of Montana writers such as Richard Hugo, Bud Guthrie, Darcy McNichol, Wallace Stegner, and especially James Welch have received considerable and diverse critical attention, there remain sizable gaps in the analysis of the state's ever-growing and ever-evolving canon. All Our Stories Are Here seeks, therefore, not only to build upon the exemplary foundational work of Bill Beavis, Ken Egan, Sue Hart, Rick Newby, Julie Watson, and others, but also to open further interpretive and critical conversations. Building on the critical paradigms of the past and bringing to bear some of the latest developments in literary and cultural studies, the contributors raise question and foreground issues that have not been widely addressed in the study of Montana literature, explore the work of writers who have not received their critical due, take new looks at old friends, and offer some of the first explorations of recent works by well-established artists. And so that's what the book's about. Uh, how should we proceed? Just down the road? Hi, my name is Jim Raines. Very happy to be here in Missoula and at the festival this morning. Um, and, and I'll do the same thing. I'll begin with uh, the first paragraph and then I'll say a few comments about um, Darcy McDickel as a subject of uh, research, uh, which was a very uh, rewarding experience. But let, let me begin uh, with the first uh, paragraph here. Uh, my contribution is entitled, uh, He Never Wanted to Forget It, Contesting the Idea of History in Darcy McNichols' is Surrounded. Early in the surrounded Darcy McNichols' first novel, R. Leone pauses to reflect on his home on the Flathead Reservation in Montana. Nowhere in the world, he imagined, was there a sky of such depth and freshness. He wanted never to forget it, wherever he might be in times to come. Yes, wherever he might be. Like other Montana writers, McNichol emphasizes the importance of the Western landscape and its centrality in establishing the identity of his characters. The sense of place, one of the defining characteristics of Western literature, acquires added significance in McNichol's fiction, however. McNichol's fiction naturally reflects his dual cultural identity as a member of an American Indian tribe and a Westerner. And as a Native American writer and a resident of the American West, he writes purposefully to resist the marginalization of his home and his people. Through his fiction, he endeavors to shatter the mythic, romantic, historical narrative of the West. In its place, he offers a more accurate account of its people and events, as well as the impact of national expansion and its devastation on indigenous cultures. Um, I'll be speaking uh, this afternoon as well at greater length on Darcy McNichol, but I, I can really uh, only say this. Uh, 
Darcy McNichol was a, an extraordinary individual uh, in many, many ways. And reading this around it, uh, initially, it, uh, it might appear to be much simpler than, than it really is. It's a very uh, nuanced and layered uh, work of fiction. And uh, I certainly could talk about it uh, endlessly. And I've been teaching it uh, as well uh, uh, for many years now, too. Um, uh, having always taught in Montana schools, we, uh, in addition to teaching literature, we do a lot of comp composition. And so I've always encouraged my students to write about things that they enjoy learning more about. And Darcy McNichol really is that. He was an anthropologist, he was a historian, he was a fiction writer. And uh, this uh, article, uh, my contribution here, just is a sample of that. I would certainly encourage um, all of you, as I do the rest of Montana, to, to discover his work and enjoy it. Because there, there really is a lot there to admire. Thank you. Well, Ken told you the title of my essay, and I have to read it because I don't remember what it's called. Uh, <laughs> Home on the Range, Montana Romances and Geographies of Hope. And I've been interested for a long time in how genre fiction makes meaning. Um, so a long time ago, I did a lot of work on the improbable subgenre of Vietnam nurse romance novels. Um, <laughs> <laughs> and um, so this project, in, in a sense, grew out of that. I started to discover that there were all these romance novels set in Montana. And given that they have an incredibly large readership worldwide, I thought, well, you know, I write about um, a lot of highbrow writers who have a decent readership, but their representations of Montana don't circulate in the same kind of vast economy that the romance representations circulate in. I mean, literally worldwide, millions and millions of copies. And so I was interested in, well, what kind of cultural work do these books do, and what does Montana look like to, these, to their readers? And um, what is that, how does that maybe come to bear on um, how people treat us in, say, Congress or you know, uh, in public policy because you know, they have ideas about who we are and what we do. So that's how I came to write this. Um, and I read hundreds of um, <laughs> contemporary romance novels. And I discovered, and, and the first, I'm a very slow writer, so I started this project in the early 90s. Um, and I was far more cynical when I began than when I ended. So that's where the Stegner geographies of hope comes from. And I found that um, these books do some interesting things. First of all, they really promote the idea of husbandry, not just getting one, um, <laughs> but, but taking care and nurturing. And, and most many of these books have a direct connection between uh, taking care of the land is a kind of indicator that a person will be able to take care of another human being. Um, and so also animal husbandry, taking care of animals, indicates one's worthiness as taking care of human beings. So there's a whole uh, kind of ethic of care that plays out from the romance and um, into the way these people take care of the place. Um, so there's a, a real strong ethic for loving the land, which was interesting to me. And the other thing that really struck me, I belong to a rancher organization. In my other life, I'm a rancher. And over and over again, um, ranchers deal with problems of inheritance, family difficulties that break up the ranch, problems with communication. And one of the things that these novels do, pretty much to the novel, I mean, that I didn't find any that didn't do this, is um, the hero and the heroine, or the heroine and heroine, uh, can be attracted to each other, but they aren't suited to each other, and they can't end the novel successfully unless they communicate verbally their love. Um, and so it creates a place, instead of the kind of silent Westerner, it creates a place where speech and and verbal communication is absolutely critical to survival. So those are some of the things that interested me in this project. Well, our panel is called New Directions in Montana Writing, and um, it's always fun to like sit there and go, well, I'm not in the right place, but I, <laughs> I am in the right place. But I want to make it clear that um, the topic that I dealt with 
in our anthology was not a new direction. Maybe talking about that topic is a new direction, but in fact, there is a pretty long and early tradition of featuring same-sex desire in Montana fiction, and that's what I deal with. While many writers and readers um, have been willing to acknowledge, acknowledge the homosocial nature of the West in the late 1800s and early 1900s, um, we had two, two prolific Montana writers who were willing and able to take that a few steps farther from homosocial to homoerotic to homosexual. And that was Myron Brennig who started writing in 1929, or got published in 1929, and then Thomas Savage, whose first Montana book came out in 1944. And just to show you that it's not a new direction, I brought as a, as a prop Myron Brennig's first Monta Montana novel, which was Singerman, the 1929 one, and hard to find. <clears throat> um, so socially and politically, I think perhaps some of the things that they wrote about were, were um, considered to be a violation. But for many subjects, it would have been a natural trajectory of story. And it certainly was for Brennig and Savage. There's another way in which um, my topic is not new at all. And that was the literary tangling of queerness with tragedy. In fact, that's probably a pretty old thing. And, and when we start talking about that, it, I find that it displeases my liberally leaning, liberally bent friends who presume that if the queer is always killed in the end or kills in the end, that um, in a story's end, so in life, and that's not good. To me, this misappropriates the role of literature in our culture. Whether it's queerness or landscape, our culture has a deep and abiding love-hate relationship. That's what I deal with in my essay. In fact, several Montana-based or Montana-related writers have found aspects of queerness useful in telling that larger story of Western ambivalence. Now, when I started out with the project, um, these many years ago, I like, I like to kind of come <laughs> make that sound longer than it was. It just feels like it. Um, because it's true. Yeah, it is true. <laughs> Carl, Carl has pointed out on different occasions that uh, in the process of creating this book, uh, people were born, people lived their lives. <laughs> and died. They passed on. Someday. And other generations. Uh, <laughs> sorry, Carl. Yeah, that's OK. <laughs> so. That was many years ago when I started out with the project. I remember telling the editor, um, kind of insisting that um, I wanted to tell a simple story about queer writing in Montana. And I did not want to do queer theory, postmodern theory. I didn't really want to do any theorizing at all. And mainly because I didn't feel at the time that I was smart enough to do that. Now, if you study queer theory and postmodern theory, um, as I have since then, you don't necessarily have to be the sharpest knife in the drawer. I mean, anyone can jump in there and participate. As I have proven. <laughs> <laughs> so I simply wanted to illuminate these writers who um, I say were not forgotten, they were obscured. And we can think of the different reasons for that. And I wanted to let their voices to be heard again. But as the years progressed and we got deeper into the project and kept working on it, um, I discovered a common reaction to the discussion of queer themes, and that was resistance. And it came from all, kind, all quarters. And if you want to imagine what that kind of resistance is like, here's a hypothetical example. Imagine if Paul, in A River Runs Through It, if his lover had been an, an Indian man. And imagine if instead of being killed as a result of you know getting into gambling debt, if he had been gay bashed. So now imagine, just with those two slight changes, what kind of impact that story would have had on Montana life and culture. And you can then kind of piece together what some of the reactions are 
when we talk about the real, not hypothetical, gay and lesbian lives in Montana stories. So I kind of came around to some, to some theory, theorizing and really wanted to get at why otherwise fairly worldly and smart people express distaste or indifference to something that is actually quite indigenous to Montana literature. I want to suggest that perhaps the new direction in Montana writing is a really honest, unsentimental, uncomfortable grappling with our ambivalences. I'm reminded of a couple of cover stories from High Country News over the last couple of years. The first one, the um, title or the tagline was, are we loving our mountain towns to death? And the writer claims that if we truly do care about the Rocky Mountain West and the urban wilderness interface, we wouldn't live here. <laughs> Instead, we'd go back to some of those depopulated towns in eastern Montana and where there's, we take that abandoned infrastructure and bring it back to life and learn how to telecommute. A more recent cover story, um, which is an, another angle of this, is, was uh, based on Annie Prue and her experience in Wyoming's Red Desert. She actually lives there and there was a, and recently Published put a together a book about the Red Desert. And, and Prue is quoted as insisting that she doesn't love the Red Desert where she lives and writes about. Mm -hmm. And that it is a very peopled, and always will be a very peopled, very human landscape. And that as soon as you love it, you've lost it. So this seems to me, if it, it's messy and it's uncomfortable um, and it's tragic, and it may be an old direction, it may be a new direction, but it may be the direction that Montana writing is going. Although Ken Egan argues otherwise in his fine book, Hope and Dread in Montana Literature, which you all need to read too. Is this on? Yeah, it is on. Okay. Uh, Carl and I sing in harmony. He and I comprise, that is to say, we're interested in uh, at least two of the same writers. And he uh, and I, as I started to say, comprise the middle of this book that did, as has been said, have a long gestation. <laughs> we are gay and lesbian literature under a big sky. And Just us two. Yes. <laughs> we, and my partner yeah. has said that we are now permanently married <laughs> in literature. He's very concerned about that. Which David is not completely happy about. <laughs> uh, just by way of advertising, uh, if you're interested in uh, not just Tom Savage, but his novelist wife, Betty or Elizabeth Savage, uh, Carl and I are going to be doing a uh, session later this afternoon on, on the both of them. As far as this goes, Brady, Nancy, and I did a, a smaller version of this presentation a month ago at the Western Literature Association annual conference over in South Dakota. And I am not going, contrary to my appearance there, I'm not going to read any of my uh, perhaps ponderous paragraphs from my long article. Uh, you might be interested in knowing that retired fiction professor Earl Gans, who's a good friend of Carl's among others here, uh, when he approached, what, about 30 years ago, Mr. H.G. Miriam, Dr. H.G. Miriam, about who he, Gantz, might work on, and, and more to the point, folks, who was, in Miriam's estimation, the best writer in this state. Miriam, uh, without hesitation, right, said, Myron Brinig, sometime or late of Butte, and Myron Brinig has mostly uh, disappeared off the chart, as had or has uh, Tom Savage. In the latter case, some of us, particularly Carl and and maybe obnoxiously myself are, are on a crusade here in recent years to uh, return this writer who is from my corner of Montana, the southwest corner of the Beaverhead Valley, back to some uh, position that I think uh, he, if not his wife as well, deserves in the front lines of uh, the canon of uh, regional literature here. 
as far as my uh, <coughs> article goes, I, I focus largely on Savage's best novel, which you all need to go by and read, The Power of the Dog, if you have not. It was published 31 years after The Surrounded, so that will be a nice tour, quick tour for you through the 20th century if you, if you haven't read those two titles yet. Uh, you might be interested, and I also talk about Brokeback Mountain, which seems to be a story that uh, has become, has it not, more famous than any other short story that Annie Prue has published. You might be interested to hear that Tom Savage's daughter told me years ago that the idea of Brokeback Mountain, Prue took from her father. Since Prue and Savage, it turns out, were friends and had, uh, at least in, by the 1990s, had, had a literary friendship. I do engage a little bit in uh, queer theory. Uh, that's Brady's fault in part. <laughs> and uh, I try to look at uh, a novel and a short story to see how, uh, how gay characters are treated and how the theoretical basis shifts from Freudian psychoanalysis to queer theory and how the latter, which is uh, which gained a great deal of uh, prominence in the academy in just the 1990s, how that has created uh, a much greater space in some ways, at least, for characters who are gay or lesbian. So, and in my article, I also try to bring this back to Montana. This was written 103 years ago, my article was. At least it feels like that. Actually, I feel stupid about it in one sense because I'd, uh, there was no mention of any Ang Lee film coming out But when I wrote about Brokeback Mountain. So instead of being ahead of the curve, I got way behind the curve, uh, thanks to the, um, the slowness of academic publishing, I guess you could say. But they're, they're, well, I think I'll stop. <laughs> yeah. I would like to say, uh, before we open things up, it, it didn't take quite as long as has been suggested. <laughs> and I also point out, it has a very nice and shiny cover uh, and uh, respectable contents. Uh, well, uh, so thanks, thanks to all, all you folks. And so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, at the onset, uh, we'd like to engage in a conversation, and so we will open it up for uh, questions, comments, uh, anything you want to say to us on the basis of our few remarks, and please. I, when I moved to Bolton a few years ago, I joined a reading group just to meet people and stuff, and one of the first books we read was Power of the Dog, and uh, that was the first time I discovered that I grew up in Dillon, and we spent uh, a lot of time in the summers, and I worked on hay crews and stuff when I was a little older. Oh, on the Brenner Ranch. You did. I did. Oh, and uh, we were family friends of Liz and Bob uh, James, and she was Liz Elizabeth Brenner. And uh, so I didn't make that connection, and I finally called my mom. She lives in Florida now, and uh, she's oh sure yeah I knew Tom Savage. And she said he used to come visit there at ranch and stuff. So. It was one of those literary moments for me that just <clears throat> really brought things together. So since I tried to read everything I could, Tom Savage is, of course, that's my comment. Thanks. Good. I'll have, I'll have to visit with you. <laughs> Don't be shy. Uh, uh, do a number of you, uh, I wonder, are some of you uh, teachers and teach Montana writing uh, now and then, or just people who like to read? You're also welcome. You don't have, you don't have to teach this stuff. <laughs> Please. Well, I have a question for Carl. Um, there seems to be a, a lot of um, male homoerotic fiction in mm -hmm. Montana literature. Uh, what about female homoerotic? I mean, is that... Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> um, and there's a kind of a disclaimer with my essay that I was tackling a certain time period, fiction written during and about a certain time period, and it seemed that it was writ fiction written by men about mainly men's lives. Um, 
And I asked a lot of women I know, historians, writers, um, book lovers in Montana, I said, where are corresponding stories um, of lesbian uh, eroticism in Montana and lesbian lives? And no one could point me in, to anything um, except for maybe some contemporary stuff. And I wasn't dealing with contemporary literature. so. I want to know where it is, and I feel that there's a whole world out there that needs to be uncovered. Well, but then, okay, let's move the question to Nancy. Nancy, you studied um, uh, heterosexual romance. Well, not entirely. I did find, um, and I, after doing far too many uh, Western romance novels, I really, there are, there are a lot. Montana seems to be very popular. But there are many um, lesbian Montana romances. And so I, I think I deal with one in particular. I teach a historical lesbian Montana romance frequently. Um, we'll be doing so this summer, I um, mean this semester. But um, I found quite a few. And, but they're all contemporary. I mean, <coughs> some are historical and some are uh, set in contemporary times. But it's definitely, and they work remarkably in similar ways to the heterosexual ones. Well, I guess I was going to wonder, what did you learn about Montana women from reading the, the romance literature set and characterizing Montana women? Um, the, the women in these novels are uh, physically vigorous. Uh, they're often, and, and statistically, they, this do, doesn't bear out that the single women ranchers in Montana, according to census data, are usually widowed women over the age of 65. In romance novels, there are many, many, many single 20-something, 30-something <laughs> ranchers. So they're, they're business owners, they're physically um, adept, um, they're strong-minded, strong-willed, and um, they have really strong land ethic. Um, and so there are a series of kind of tests to see if you know if the potential other will kind of be a suitable mate, and and there's not a lot of difference in that structure. I think partly because these um, genres are so rigidly structured, there's not a lot of difference between um, the heterosexual and the lesbian romances. Yes, please. I'm a high school librarian in Billings, and. There's quite a need for young adult literature for the gay and lesbian. Um, I would like some authors of, I mean, I, I can find some that are written for 13, 14 year olds, but are there some adult ones that would be suitable for older teens? Yeah, the, the one I teach regularly, and it's getting a little, you can get it on Amazon now, is called Montana Feathers by Penny Hayes. And it's a historical, and um, there's a, uh, young woman of some social consequence from the East who comes to Montana for the summer to stay with her aunt and uncle. And she has a fiance uh, back East. And she falls in love with Montana and with uh, the countryside. And she falls in love with a widowed um, woman sheep rancher. And she finally eschews the bad fiance and her pushy life in the East and embraces the kind of difficult but meaningful life in Montana. So it's, I mean, Montana's clearly a fantasy space there, but um, it's, it reminds me a little bit, bit of the film Big Eden. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you know that film. It's a charming film set in Montana, I think by a Montana writer, screenwriter. Um, so where Montana functions clearly as a fantasy space, um, but the community is very affirming, and um, and I think it's it's you know at least temporarily between the pages of the book it's a it's a wonderfully safe space, imaginative space. And I have some others I could okay. tell you after. I think the Power of the Dog by Thomas Savage would be enjoyed by some seniors, teen readers, yeah. um, for its mystery and um, a young tension. young it's tension and a young person being the the hero. If you can, uh, if you can get by the first page, 
Yeah. Yeah. Well, as a teen reader, I would have loved that first page. <laughs> <laughs> yes, the opening paragraph. Uh, well, not to be mysterious about it, but it. Well, Alan, you can describe it better than I can. <laughs> <laughs> It's castration time on the ranch. <laughs> That's enough. Yes, thank like you very well said. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's pretty rough down there in Dillon, I guess. <laughs> well, with Thomas Savage, everything comes around full circle. So it opens with castration time and it ends with something. Yeah. Different kinds of emasculation. There's another question out there. Yes, please. Yeah. Um, I'm, a, I'm a, a writer, and I've been in my past, so I guess I should consider myself. I'm, I'm at the stage of having written one book and trying to form a series and try and find agents and get published on. So that's the stage I'm at. But the, um, my curiosity coming here today and what I'm trying to pull out of you, I got bits and pieces, you know, getting back to the title, New Directions. You know, I'm trying to get a sense of where Montana writing is now. And I and I got bits, the part that came through the strongest is the whole uh, data, you know, the, the, the desire to clarify not only the historical, but hopefully uh, bring to the fore even more uh, current writers in that. What, what I didn't get, um, and, and clarify if I'm wrong in capturing that part of the presentation, but is what else you were trying to say, uh, the other two panelists, in terms of, um, you know, I, I got what you were doing research-wise, but I was having a hard time tying that into, in my typical linear brain, um, you know, how, what did that, mean in terms of the direction of right you know what were you trying to say in terms of relating that back to where Montana writing is today and what you see you know happening you know among writers do you want to comment on that yeah. I'm, gonna, I'm gonna try to answer that question best I can relative to Darcy McNichol uh, in terms of new directions um, Really, um, Darcy McNichol was very much interested in, um, I, I would say, maybe alternative history. Uh, Native Americans, um, historically, and uh, I think even up to the present in Montana, have always been, um, I think, circumscribed. And one of the things I do first day of class in Native American studies is go through all the popular culture imagery of Native Americans. Paintings, films, uh, uh, stories, uh, where there is a, uh, a very distinct persona. Uh, but it's a persona not of their choosing. It's one that's been set forth uh, by a national narrative, I believe. And then it gets played out, I think, in popular culture. And even for most of our students uh, coming from small towns in Montana, they believe much of that to be true uh, without really knowing very many Native American um, individuals or families or, or even communities. And so uh, perhaps to your question, I, 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 would, uh, I would guess that a lot of uh, writers uh, who are trying to um, establish new narratives or alternative narratives um, who are um, in some ways playing with those conventional narratives and notions of uh, the American West and the Western character and the, the silent uh, Westerner and all of those kinds of things um, in, in, in very much the same way, same way someone like uh, Clint Eastwood does in Unforgiven. Playing with uh, those uh, kinds of uh, stereotypes and, and trying to deconstruct them I think but also at the same time being constrained by genre. The Western, I think, as a genre is very constraining. And I think even McNichol himself, I don't know if you all found that in your uh, uh, writers as well, are very constrained by the, uh, the elements of, uh, of genre. And Westerns always have to have guns. Right? And there always has to be a showdown at the end. Right? And there's always the test of one's manhood and those kinds of things. So are you saying they're breaking up? there's an attempt to try to break out of that and sort of create a, a new genre, but maybe a, a broader, <coughs> allowing for different you know, views of the West. Well, Is it yeah, happening more? <coughs> yes, I think to both of those, in, in, the, in the case of Darcy McNichol, I think he's trying to complicate those narratives. Right? I don't think he's trying to replace them with something simpler or something easier. I think he's trying to make them more complicated and, and create a kind of an awareness and appreciation for uh, the way in which uh, Native Americans, for example, have been um, uh, 
uh, marginalized or, or, or even within our uh, sparsely populated region pushed to the periphery uh, of our society because of those ideas. And I think in some ways my essay works almost in an opposite sense. So I look at among the most constrained forms of uh, literary production uh, where most writers of romances have tip sheets, they have a word count, um, they know that certain things have to happen in a certain number of pages. So it's an incredibly rigid form and it's um, incredibly conventional. But to look at that and say, okay, so here's an extremely limiting form and there's this proliferation of representations of our place. And they're mostly, I mean, not, it's hard to find out, they're mostly women pseudonyms. Um, uh, romance novel publishers are remarkably closed mouth about information, like, you know, I would be an industrial spy or something. Um, <laughs> but they're, they're written largely for women and I think largely by women. And um, Bill Beavis, among others, have talked about, and we've just had an example from Carl, of the difficulty in finding a wide array of published representations of Montana by women up until, particularly until the contemporary period. So I was interested in, okay, here's a whim, kind of a women's genre, mostly women writers, uh, really rigid form. Instead of just dismissing it as, oh, this has to be crap, you know, can't, it can't tell any kind of truth about where we are. I wanted to say, well, let, you know, look at it again. And so I think for me the new direction is to take literature that's mostly reviled by academics and dismissed and take it seriously. And since it is incredibly um, widely disseminated and for many readers will, rep will be the only representation they ever get about where we live, um, I thought, well, you know, what happens if you take it seriously? So partly, I guess my pitch is for taking genre liter literature seriously. I think just about the only writing we have about urban Montana is in genre fiction, mostly detective fiction. Um, and so um, a way to kind of uncover different facets of Montana experience, I think, is through genre fiction. I wanted to add that, um, and Jim will be doing a session on The Surrounded uh, later, maybe this will come up, and I want to plug that, because it's a wonderful novel, but Darcy McNichol wrote an earlier vision version of The Surrounded called The Hungry Generations, um, and so, so The Surrounded may represent the new direction. The Surrounded, the character, ends up... Um, you know, sympathizing with traditional ways and kind of turning that direction, and it ends up tragic. Um, the earlier version, he ends up becoming a nice farmer with uh, the stamp of approval from the white folks who are running the reservation, and it does not uh, end up tragic in the earlier version. And Bridget Hands, who edited the earlier version, said, had he stuck with that, that would have sold really well and he would have been a much more popular writer in 1936. And he took about half of that and trashed it and made it the novel that we know today and it wasn't so popular um, among white readers. It's not exactly the story that uh, folks in the mainstream wanted to read. I, I think that's very fascinating. Just, just an, as a side to that, the, the celebration of the surrounded, uh, that's a big part of uh, this year's uh, reading, we hope, in Montana, and, and a, a big part of uh, our interest. Uh, you know, if you think of uh, McNichol as a contemporary of Hemingway's, uh, The Surrounded, uh, if you, I think if you read it carefully, if you read it well, I think you'll find it as great uh, a work on its, uh, on its uh, artistic, literary, uh, thematic accomplishments as uh, any work by Hemingway. This, this is an incredibly important book that doesn't get nearly uh, enough attention particularly uh, not enough attention at home, but uh, beyond in the rest of the U.S. So take a copy with you uh, when you try. Uh, other questions, please. Uh, I just wanted, if anyone could 
any of you could comment on. Uh, I began an argument with a friend some 25 years ago about this sense of place. And he, uh, he had moved around more than I had as a young person, and that affected his thing. But he thought we were, I was really hung up on this sense of place, Montana as a character, and the importance of the rural lifestyle, the mountains, the trees, and everything. And he felt like it pulled you away from some of the larger themes, and, and he felt like you know, I and maybe Montana writers needed to branch out. And of course, a lot of our good published writers in Montana are writing on themes completely apart from Montana or Western writing. And then writers like Walt Steger were always branded Western writers, which wasn't fair you know, think either, because I think he did break out. But any comments on that? Is it a trap to, to be stuck on the theme of Montana or Western writing? I'll start. <laughs> literature of place is, be, is maybe the uh, greatest literary cliche regional literature and our literature has. And uh, I've cherished it. I've held it close to me. I've tried to write it myself, although mine's uh, over in Puget Sound, because that's my home country, quote unquote, or my first place. Some of the most interesting critical work being done now by folks uh, whom Nancy and I know uh, in literatures of the American West suggest that place is, uh, has a hybridity and a mobility and a fluidity to it that uh, is quite apart from is quite apart from uh, historical or even near historical representations of it as though as though. Uh, literature to be of value has to just be uh, set, for example, in the Mission Valley. On the other hand, I would just uh, throw out that the notion of regionalism in, in my reading of American literary history has mostly been, uh, that term has been mostly a pejorative term. I like to think that that's changed. Uh, I'd like to think that's changed in the last uh, couple of generations. I believe that at least by the 1990s, it enjoys a critical cachet that perhaps it didn't before. I've just been reading the new uh, Philip Fredkin's biography of Wallace Stegner, as a matter of fact, and uh, am reminded by Wally Stegner's statements again and again that uh, any literature of value is local, and uh, local leads to universal, and anything that attempts to be something other than that. And this is not precluding literature, road, you know, American road lit, or literature that is uh, has uh, two dozen physical settings within it, or whatever you want. Uh, but the, my point is that if regionalism enacts and and uh, privileges the local, then that's a that's a damn good thing. Uh, one of our well, that was popular. No, well, uh, one of our contributors. Uh, this, you know, it's an interesting question. It's a, it's a, it's a, always a question or a debate. I think still in, in Western studies. And uh, the first uh, chapter uh, in the book is written uh, uh, by a Canadian. So we have an international cast of uh, contributors uh, from all over the U.S. and Canada. And in this uh, first chapter, uh, the, the scholar, a fellow named Tomasz de Bozzi, uh he writes about Richard. Ford's Montana literature, and Ford insists that place doesn't matter, it's just uh, uh, a terrain in which people invest certain kinds of desires. Uh, when I find that a really fascinating idea, and very contrary, to, I think, to how we usually think about place, a place you know, has weight, it has substance, it, it, it makes an impact on us, it shapes our consciousness, uh, and he, here Ford offers, oh no, it's just what you want. You He's just, just you, being arch. Yeah, yeah. it yeah. could be, but yeah. it's, it's, it's yeah. nonetheless had in New Jersey. It's not a. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Nonetheless, it's it's interesting, and, and I, I think a nice uh, contestation of uh, the romanticized sense of place. Lois Welch's essay in the collection also deals with this issue as she um, situates the University of Montana creative writing program in a kind of local, national, and international context. I think we have uh, maybe time for one more, uh, one more question, comment. Uh, 
Yes, please. In terms of the creative writing program in the university system, how has it changed, say, like from 10 years ago? What's different? More women, fewer boys. <laughs> uh, oh. <laughs> I feel the sting. Ooh. In uh, Lois Welch's essay in here, uh, she points out that for a while there seemed to have been a height requirement. Uh, um, <laughs> you had to be six foot six, uh, preferably sporting a beard. I mean, this is. Uh, <laughs> I'm just quoting. Uh, you, you can look it up, but uh, I mean, radically changed. I mean, uh, part of what is, uh, I think, one of the threads we perhaps all have in common is uh, we, we like to uh, promote Montana lit. We enjoy, we love Montana writing, uh, but we find that uh, as uh, scholars that s some things have not received their due, and I think women writers in Montana have not received anywhere near enough crit critical attention. Uh, but I think. Uh, I think the spine has been broken on that. I think there's lots of change, there's lots of interest in women writers, and yeah, Nancy's right, the height requirement uh, and the beard requirement seems to have, uh, well, it's more open. I mean, really it is. Yeah. There's a panel tomorrow, Lois and a couple of folks from the creative writing faculty are uh, speaking on the history of the program, uh, and so you might, you might uh, depending on what your schedule is tomorrow, you might return them. And pose that. <laughs> well, thank you so much. <laughs>